Luke chapter 23. If you found your way there, you want to go to verse 26. And we'll read through the end of the chapter. Now, as they led him, meaning Jesus, away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people following him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore and breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, or Golgotha, the other uh, Gospels identify, the place of the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, You are the king of the Jews. Save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, saying, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, Hey, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, or about noon, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, or until about 3 p.m. And then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands... I commit my spirit. And one of the other Gospels recounts for us his very last words were, It is finished. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. (coughs) That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb, how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. The cross. If you read, and it was interesting, uh, one of the guys at the pastor's conference, one of the speakers, uh, mentioned this as well. If you read the sermons in the book of Acts, the first sermons of the church, you find a central theme to every single one of them. The cross and the resurrection. 
If you were to listen to every sermon that was preached today, just one day, in all of the churches of Christendom, you would find a lot of subjects, but you might not find that many that really include the cross and the resurrection. But to the early church, that was the most important thing. All the other stuff was added to, were the benefits of, were the consequences of the cross and the resurrection. But the central point is the cross and the resurrection. We can read through this story of the cross. We can read through the, the story of the suffering of Jesus. And next week when we come to the place of reading about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we'll hear things that we've heard before as Christians. And looking around this room, I see many of you have been in the faith for a number of years. You've heard it before. You've been to many Good Friday services and Easter morning services and all those sorts of things. And the words themselves become so familiar that sometimes we forget what the meaning of the words is. And sometimes as we listen to this recounting of all these people and characters coming in and their particular reactions to the cross, we can just go, oh yeah, that's the two thieves. Yeah, I remember that part. Oh yeah, there's the women and they're getting ready for spices. I remember that part. And there's Simon the Cyrenian. Yeah, boy, I bet he was bummed out he came to Jerusalem that Passover, wasn't he? And you, we can start to think of all those things and forget that, you know what? Each of the gospel writers took part of the story and put it into their gospel. Not any of them chose everything. That's why we study all four gospels, because they give us a more complete picture. Although, as John says, hey, many other things Jesus did while he was on earth. And if I were to try and recount all of them, I don't think the world could hold all the books it would take to write down all the things that Jesus did. But these I write so that you might believe that he is the Son of God and by believing might have life in his name. There was a purpose for every one of them. They didn't just sit down and go, oh, the Spirit's upon me. I'm going to write a gospel today. No, they used their brain, and they had a thought process, and they were thinking about the people that they were writing to, and the Gospels are very different in their style and in the people that they were writing to. And so right here, Luke doesn't tell us that the casting of lots for his garments was a fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture because he's not writing primarily to Jews. So for others, it wasn't as important as some of the other things to his audience. So what's my point? My point is we want to dig into this a little bit today and maybe unearth it in a slightly different way to help us really think about what was going on there. Because the cross is the central part to your life. Not just to the universe. You could consider time on a, on a line. And that's how we kind of think of it. Time is progressing and it's moving from it was five minutes ago five minutes ago and five seconds and now it's now and things are moving forward and we can think of looking back down the line or looking forward up the line and if you were to take all of creation the creation of this universe that we know and take all the time of it from the very beginning when God said let there be light until the day when the new heaven and the new earth are created you would find a central point. I don't know if it's in the middle or anything, but it's a fulcrum point. And that is the point of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing that ever happened to mankind. The most important. Without it, we would be trying to follow a list of rules and regulations that the Scripture itself declares to us we can't do. And that's not why it was given. It wasn't given because God said, well, let's see if we can do this, and then we'll let them in. No, it was given to us and as an instruction point to know we can't do it on ourselves. And to lead us to the point in revelation of Jesus Christ, of God providing a sacrifice so that we could be part of the family of God. So, let's consider, first of all, some of the people who were observers of this whole day. 
How about Simon? And let's consider both Simon and Simon, right? There's Simon Peter, right? Simon Peter says, I will protect you, Lord. I've got my sword. I will go to my death for you. And just a few hours before what happens here on this page, he tried to kill somebody unsuccessfully, got reprimanded by the Lord to put his sword away, that this isn't the time for this. I can take care of myself, basically, he said, right? Here's Peter with a little sword, because the swords that they had were probably kind of giant daggers, you know? They weren't like a big broadsword or something that these guys had, but they were more like a very large dagger. And, and he's got this little sword, and there's the Lord who says, Peter, if I wanted to, I could call down legions and legions of angels, and they don't miss. <laughs> right? That's kind of a, how would you feel if you just stepped out in, in a way that could cost you your life, and your Lord goes, no, 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 no. I, I don't need that. You're missing the point. And it says it without naming him, but it says that those who followed him watched from a distance of what happened. And it, and it points out the women, but there were others there as well. John certainly was there and close enough to hear the Lord speak to him and to Mary, Jesus' mother, from the cross. I believe Peter was probably there observing all of this. What was going through his mind? How about Simon the Cyrenian? Cyrene is a city in Libya. So he had traveled, I don't know, 800, 900 miles, uh, wasn't able to take JetBlue or Libya Air. So this took him some time to get there, to be there for the Passover. And he walks into Jerusalem and gets accosted by this crowd that's going through Jerusalem and by some Roman soldiers who had the legal right to come to command people to bear a load for them. And there was kind of a rule of thumb that you commanded them to carry the load for one mile. That's why Jesus said, hey, if you get committed, somebody asks you to carry a load for one mile, do it for two. See what that does to them. See what that does to you. But here he comes, and he has got to take either the full cross or just the cross piece. We don't know which, but they would do both in some. But it doesn't matter. Here's this bloody mess of a man and two other criminals on their way to the execution. And they go, you, come on over here. We need some help. And he carries the cross. There's an interesting thing about Simon the Cyrenian. Because if you consider what he had to do, and then he's walking with Jesus and he hears him. He's close enough to hear him speaking to the women as we recount just a little bit later. And he can watch this one who is without strength to carry the cross himself. That's why they would have gotten somebody else to carry it for him. And yet he hears him silent. Not crying out, I don't deserve this. Not crying out, somebody help me. God have mercy on me. But no. What did that do to him? And then what happened when they got to Golgotha? Did he just walk away? Go, okay, that's, I'm done. No, I kind of think he would stay to kind of see what's going to happen and kind of scope out the whole thing, at least for a while. Maybe not for the full hours long time that Jesus was on the cross. But here's something very interesting. There's good reason to believe that Simon of Cyrene got saved. Say that five times. Simon of Cyrene got saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, why do I say that? Well, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark identifies him as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, why in the world would he you know, call out, oh, you remember, this is Simon the Cyrenian, and he's got two kids. Okay, that's in Mark 15, 21, if you don't believe me. And those are two men that Mark assumed his Roman readers would know. Hey, this, this is the guy, you know, we, there's a real person involved here. Then in Paul, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans in 1613, he uh, greets a Christian named Rufus possibly the 
son of Simon the Cyrenian. And most scholars believe that Simon and his two sons became well-known Christians who were held in honor in the church. It's, it's not absolutely true, but it's, there's some good reasons to think it, and I can't imagine that it didn't strike him to the core of his heart to watch this one and to carry his cross. How about the women mourning? The women mourning were focused on the immediate, right? They were focused on what's happening right here. This is horrible. And we don't know whether these women had some of them been some of the followers from Galilee. Or perhaps they were just people who in Jerusalem saw this big parade coming down from the Mount of Olives and across the Kidron Valley and into the Eastern Gate on what we call Palm Sunday, but just a few days before this, where Jesus is being hailed by everybody. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's sing the Psalms that declare the Messiahship. And everybody knew what that meant. And the Pharisees said, Jesus, tell your people to shut up. Don't you realize what they're saying? And he said, oh, no, not this time. I've told them to be quiet before, but this time, if I tell them to be quiet, you're going to see rocks start to cry this out. So no, no, no. Just a few days before, so maybe some of these women were women who saw this and are going, oh, maybe it's the hope of Israel. Maybe, and, and this is Passover. What an appropriate time. This is awesome. And then right here at Preparation Day and Passover Day, they're seeing the same one, bloodied and beaten, so much that he was unrecognizable to most, carrying this cross with his writ of execution, which is what they would do. They would write down the crime that you were accused of, and they would nail that to the cross above you so that everybody would see and know, oh, that's what they did. So that walking by, because many times they would let people hang on a cross for days and days, it might take them to die. And people walking by would see that horrible death and they would go, I'm not going to do that, what he did, because this is what happens. And here's Jesus carrying his condemnation. We read it. Here's the king of the Jews. Here's the king of the Jews. That's his condemnation. Wow, maybe they were seeing this and maybe realizing. And, and so they're crying out and crying out. What does Jesus say? In essence, he says, don't look at what's right in front of you. Think about it in the whole context. This is nothing compared to what shall come. If they do this in the green wood at the very beginning, what will happen when it's dry? Hey, you know what? The wood's getting dry. The wood's getting real, real dry today. We sang it. Oh, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We look at the world around us, and we see the rising up more and more of evil in this world and calling evil good and good evil over and over and over again throughout the world. And we read the book of Revelation and we read the gospel accounts of when the disciples ask, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And we read the book of Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And we go, wow, this looks like today. Man, it just kind of keeps moving into place. The little slots keep falling into the tumblers, fall in the slots. Yeah, it's getting dry. It's getting dry. And you read the book of Revelation and you see what will happen in the context of thinking of Jesus as one man being executed compared to, okay, the first few seals essentially destroy 25% of the population. 25. Can you imagine that? How, how many, I didn't look it up. How many people are in the world today? Several billion. Hmm? 7.3 billion. I knew someone would know that. <laughs> 7.3 billion people. A quarter of them, shh, gone. 
Think about what happened at, at, on 9-11. 3,000 people died. It's horrible. Affected everybody so much. What? Multiply that by a lot. And get to 2 billion? 1.5 billion? I knew there were some mathematicians in this place. One and a half billion people? Can you imagine? And I hope the, uh, not, nobody in here who knows the Lord will be in this position who is a follower of Jesus Christ. But imagine being here after the church leaves. Okay, that alone is going to take a whole lot of people out of the world. And then things start happening in the world and you open up the paper and it goes, yeah, two billion people died yesterday. Inexplicably boggles the mind. If they do this in the green, what will happen in the dry? Yeah. You know, sometimes we look at things very narrowly and at a very short focus length. Even the things in our lives and the events of our lives and the actions and activities and attitudes of our own self. Man, we need, to, we need to open up the perspective a bit. And we need to look a little bit farther down the road. And it might put all of those things that seem so important and are gripping so much, put them in the right perspective. Perspective of eternity. The perspective of eternity. The soldiers unaware of the momentous events taking place, just doing their job. Hey, my job is to kill people. That's what I do. I get paid pretty good for it. I kind of get to enjoy it a little bit, or sometimes it's kind of gross, but this is what I do. I'm a Roman soldier. I execute people. I'm really good at it. I've perfected not only what has been handed to me in the methodology of crucifixion. Man, we've come up with some new little twists and turns to it. And I know exactly how to put that nail right in the wrist, right in between the two bones so that no bone is broken. But so when they're hanging on that cross, that's what they're hanging by because we put that little block down low. So if they slump down, that will support them, but they can't breathe. And so they've got to take everything they can to do what's that called, the iron cross or whatever in gymnastics when the guy holds himself up like this, right? To do that after having been beaten and lost all that blood and strength and then being nailed to the cross, to pull that up so that you can breathe and hold it and hold it and breathe, and then let go. You see, suffocation is the way that most people die on a cross. That's why it would take so long. Suffocation is a horrible way to die. If you've ever been close to someone in the hospital who dies of emphysema or lung cancer, it's a horrible way to die. You're being suffocated for years. On the cross, they were suffocated along with the pain of having a spike through your arms and your feet, or sometimes they'd just tie them, but they'd set things so it was the same deal. It would take days. It's a horrible way to die. The Romans had perfected this form of execution. And these guys are just doing their job. Hey, got, a, got an extra nail. I need one over here. I got this, that. They have no idea what's going on. It's just it's another day at work. There are many people in this world who are just living their lives that way. It's just another day at work. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. You see, back in the 60s, there was this sense and question that permeated at least the American culture and filtered out into a lot of other places in the world, which was a really strong philosophical question, whether you were Christian or not, whether you were a, intended to be a seeker or not, it was this question of, why are we here? Why are we here? And lots of people came up with lots of weird ideas. 
But it was because there was this question going through and this looking around at the plastic world around, man, it's just the establishment. There's got to be more than this. You know, we joke about that, but, but yet there was a longing that I believe is in the heart of every human being. But boy, the, the, the inability for a human being independent of God to answer that question results in kind of making up a story that sounds pretty good and I can live with and just burying deeper and deeper and deeper that soul question that rises up about why am, why am I here? I was probably, I'm going to say maybe 13 years old. I must have been in ninth grade considering the person I think I was talking to on the phone. Back in those days, there was no such thing as a cell phone. There were no mobile phones. You had to be on a phone that was attached by wire to some place in your house. So you had to be in one place. We had two phones in our house. Whoa! And the reason was we actually had two separate lines. And the reason was because my, my father was an administrator of a hospital. And one was a business line that rang in the bedroom so that if in the middle of the night some, something happened, it, he could you know, answer the phone and, and uh, deal with things. And he, he let us use that sometimes. And I didn't know why, but I figured it out later when I became a father. It's because it was in his bedroom. We were allowed to go in and actually sit on their bed, which was usually, you know, kind of a, this is off limits. You don't go in mom and dad's room. Go in there. And there was this little, they had this headboard with this sliding door. And you slid the door. And there's the phone in there, you know. It was, oh, man. It was almost like the hotline to Russia or something, you know. Slid this thing. Pull out the phone. It was, it was one of those fancy phones, too, because it was like smooth, trim line kind of thing, which was, radically new back in the 60s, right? It was not one of these big, the other one in the living room was one of the old fashioned big ones with the giant thing on top and the dial here. But this was like, the dial was right, right there in the headset. Man, this is, and it had a light in it. Man, you young people have no idea how good you have it. So anyway, I'm in there and, um, I was talking on the phone to a friend of mine, and I was just, I don't know, I was getting kind of philosophical and stuff. And I realized why my dad let us use that phone when we wanted to have a private conversation, because it wasn't private, because the door was open, and his chair in the living room, which was just around the corner there, was right there. And he has ears like you wouldn't believe. I don't mean they're big, I mean they're effective. <laughs> and I'm in there going, you know, my buddy's name was John. I said, John, you know, sometimes I just wonder, why in the world are we here? I mean, what, you know, what difference does it make? I'm just kind of, you know, just kind of those human things. And my father was not a devout Christian, radical, born again, evangelizing everybody. He grew up a Roman Catholic. He went through World War II and some harrowing experiences there, I'm sure, which he never really shared fully with us, but you just kind of get this sense. Everybody that, you know, spent four years in a foreign land, you know, not knowing what's going to happen, they all went through harrowing things and growing up in the Depression and, and all of these things. And, boy, we went to church every Sunday. Every Sunday we were there. And, and there was a faith in our house. We, we said grace before every meal, lo. Woe be unto you, you take a bite off your plate before we say grace. You know, so there was that sense. And, that, and, I, and I hung up for my friend, and I walked out, and my dad said to me, he said, when you have the question, what's my life about? Why am I here? You need to ask the question, why did God create you to be here? He put it in a whole different context. I told him about this probably oh, 10 years ago for the first time. It, it came back to my memory. I said, you know, Dad, you were something of an evangelist to my faith. 
Now, for any of you who knows my dad, that would be like, what? You know. And I explained it to him. He went, oh, really? But it's in the heart of everyone, even at a young age. What's the meaning? And God's desire by his Holy Spirit is to bring the truth to us so that we know. And step by step, because we can't take the whole thing at once. We'd explode. Our brains would just blow up and make a mess. But instead, he gives it to us step by step. But it's his desire that we would know. That we would know. And that we would spend eternity with him. Here are these Roman soldiers just about their business, crucifying the Son of God. And they had to have heard him say, Father, forgive these guys. And all the people out there. And the Sanhedrin. And all those who condemn me. For, forgive Pilate. Forgive Herod. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now let's get this straight. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing in condemning him and putting him on trial and condemning him to death. And these Roman soldiers knew exactly what they were doing down to minute detail. They were perfectionists in execution. It isn't that they didn't know what they were doing and they accidentally crucified Jesus. It was that they didn't understand what they were doing. Father, forgive them. What did that do to the heart of the one who heard that? I can't imagine. Oh, man, we got a weird one here. Maybe. Or maybe they heard it and they considered it. And they considered what this man was or is. Because at the end of the crucifixion, when he gave up his spirit, he said, all the people around started to beat their breasts. It didn't say those who were followers or those this. That. It says all of them began to beat their breasts. And what did the Roman soldier commanding officer say? It says he glorified God. Glorified God. He said, this is a righteous man. Boy, it affected them. You know, we can try and go around our business. God will invade our space. God will invade our space because he loves us that much. The thieves, hey, they're both guilty. They said as much, right? The one guy said to the other, stop giving them a hard time. Don't you have any regard for God? You're about to meet them face to face. And here you're giving this guy a hard time. We deserve this. You know he doesn't. Everyone knew he was innocent. It was apparent to them. This guy's innocent. They're both guilty. One mocks, one asks for grace. One mocks, one asks for grace. Joseph of Arimathea. Quietly following Jesus and caring for him. Quietly. Kind of like Nicodemus going to Jesus at night. Joseph of Arimathea puts his own reputation and life at risk to go ask for the body of Jesus. Absolutely. Pilate was a notoriously evil man. The scriptures record the only thing that he said or his reaction was, is he dead already? Are you sure? He didn't expect him to, to die that quickly. You remember the soldiers went through because they wanted to get the, uh, the Jews asked, would you please take these executed guys down off the cross before the Passover? It's an abomination for the Passover. Even if they're Gentiles, just get them down. This is an abomination, blood flowing and so forth. So what they would do was they would go break their legs so that they couldn't support themselves on that block anymore. So, boom, they're done. No way they can live through an hour, a few moments. And they came to Jesus and went, he's dead already. Now there's some scholars who are not of a believing uh, group that say, well, Jesus really didn't die. He swooned. He went into a coma. 
looked like he was dead, but he wasn't really dead. The Roman soldiers were experts at execution and at death, and they knew when one was dead and not dead. And oh, by the way, when they scourged someone, as we talked about last week, that very oftentimes killed them right there because it was so intense and such a suffering. And here this guy is scourged, then they put the robe back on him so that blood just sticks to that robe. And then they lay a cross on him and he's so weak he can't carry it. They get Simon to carry it for him. They take him to the place of execution and they rip that robe off so they can gamble for it. Then they nail him to the cross and they hang him up there and he's there three hours. He swooned? No, he died. But he didn't die at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Absolutely not. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I give my life freely. No one takes it from me. I give my life freely. He chose the moment to say, it's finished. It's done. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Joseph puts his reputation and life at risk before Pilate to care and honor for the body of Jesus. That's pretty amazing. And there are a lot of people who go through this life doing amazing things very quietly for the Lord that none of us know about. That none of us know about. And I believe that we'll be real surprised in who's got the really big crown with lots of jewels on it and who's got this puny little thing, one, one jewel there. Because it isn't about blowing a trumpet before what we do. Hey, look at me. It's about consistently living our lives for Christ. So all these people are affected, and we can see in some of their reactions, maybe reactions of people in this world, maybe reactions of us, maybe reactions of us at a certain time or you know, so forth. They're people. This was a real event that took place. But so what? So what? Why is this so important? Three scripture passages we'll take a quick look at. First of all, turn to Acts chapter 20 chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Acts 2, 22. The event here is just about uh, 53 days after the event we are looking at. So just a little less than two months later. And the disciples are all gathered together. They're praying. They have encountered the risen Lord. He said, wait in Jerusalem. Promise of my Father is coming, and we are going, you are going to be endued with power. But wait until it comes. And this was the day it came. And they're up in the upper room, and they're praying. And suddenly there's a rushing, mighty wind sound. And then they see these divided tongues of fire above their heads, and they start praising God in languages they, d they don't know. And the whole thing gathers people around. What's going on? And some go, oh, man, they're drunk. They're drinking early, this, this Pentecost feast. And Peter stands up, no longer afraid, and says, oh, no, no, no. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then when we get down to verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Remember what Nicodemus said? He said to Jesus at night, he said, we know you're from God. Here's a member of the Sanhedrin. We. Who's we? It's the whole Sanhedrin. They knew. We know you're from God because nobody could do the things that you do unless God had sent him. They didn't understand he was the Messiah, but they knew he was from God. And here, Peter saying the same thing. He was attested to by all these things. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of the Romans? No. Of the Jews? No. Of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, 
because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, and then he quotes from the Old Testament, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. A prophecy of Jesus that he would not be buried and rot in the tomb. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make, my, you will make me full of joy in your presence. He stops quoting and gets back to speaking to the guys there. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried and we might say rotted, uh, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear, this experience of speaking in tongues and so forth. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. What does it mean? You're telling us that he was the Christ and we crucified him or we participated in? How do, how, what, what does this mean? How do I do? What, what, does, well, what do I do with this information you just gave me? What shall we do? Hmm. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And that precisely is exactly what happens today as well. We repent. What does repentance mean? Doesn't mean being sorry. Doesn't mean feeling bad or guilty. That may lead to repentance, but that's not what repentance means. Repentance literally in the Greek word means a change of the mind. You changed your mind. I changed my mind. It wasn't a good idea to crucify Jesus. I changed my mind. It isn't a good idea to go my own way and to follow my way. I've changed my mind, and therefore it's not just a change of the way of thinking, of a philosophy. It's a change of activity as well, as we'll see in a minute from a passage in Ephesians. But the key is to repent and be baptized. A lot of people say, well, I repented, but nothing's changed. Hey, I know we all struggle, and some struggles are harder. You have a substance abuse problem. Man, physically, that's a difficult thing to deal with. But God in his power is greater than that substance abuse. God in his power is greater than that violent attitude that makes you beat your wife or your children. God is greater than any of those things. And if his power is not evident in a changed life, then you got to scratch your head and go, how much of this repentance is really going? How much is there? Now, before you get all fussy and, but we're saved by grace, pastor, hang on, we'll get there. But don't limit the power of God. Don't limit the power of God. Colossians chapter 2, a couple books to the right. Colossians 2. Gentiles eat pizza constantly. You know that one? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Gentiles eat pizza constantly. 
Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a publical, a publical, <laughs> I like that word, a publical spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you, and it goes on into, into the, the thing at hand that he was dealing with. All right, there's a lot of stuff in here that doesn't connect with us necessarily. Circumcision, circumcision made with hands, circumcision made without hands, and you were dead with him and baptized him, and identifying all this stuff. It's simple. It's really actually very simple. First of all, circumcision. Circumcision was the mark of the covenant between God and Abraham and all Abraham's children. It was the mark, the physical mark that said, I am part of the covenant that God made with Abraham and there's a mark in me that says I am part of that covenant and my wife and my children are part of that covenant as well. And that's the way it worked, okay? But here he says, you were dead in your trespasses. You know what trespasses are, right? You know, they're, they're sins. They're doing the wrong thing. They're going across the line, right? And the uncircumcision of your flesh. The flesh is not in covenant with God, he's saying. You were, you were just sinning and you weren't even trying to be in covenant with God. You were totally... But now... And see, in the context of Colossians, he, he was dealing with, to some degree, the whole issue about circumcision. Do we have to be, you know, do I have to be circumcised? Do I have to eat kosher? Should I follow all the lunar festivals and so forth now that I'm a Christian? Or I was a Gentile and now am I becoming a Jew in this? And all those questions were around. So Paul is using this in, in a way that they would understand what he's talking about, but, but we kind of miss it, right? But now he talks about a circumcision not made with hands. But a, but a circumcision of the heart, a circumcision of the heart. In him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay, that's still just a little bit weird and hard to handle, but we'll get there. Okay, hang on to that. But that's circumcision. Baptism. Baptism is a wonderful picture of identifying with Christ, being dead and being raised to new life, right? That's why we go out to the, to the lake and do it there rather than just sprinkle, not coming down on people who sprinkle. I've actually sprinkled some people who couldn't physically be dunked. God's not going to say, oh, well, you know, you're really good. You believe in Jesus, but you weren't dunked. You were sprinkled. Sorry, can't let you in. It's not the way it works. But you lose the picture of identifying with Christ, being buried with him and raised. That's what's so wonderful about full immersion baptism. And it's wonderful to do it in public because it's a public declaration of something that's happened already inside. And that's the way we do it the way we do it. So, baptism, the picture of dying with Christ and being made alive. What Paul says here is we were dead because we were guilty of trespasses and we weren't part of the covenant. Man, with two strikes, and two-strike rule, I think. But now, what's the case? We're alive with him. We've been made alive with him. We've been forgiven, he says, of all trespasses. All of them. I love the way the Lord weaves together what Krista uh, says during worship and the teaching, and we don't plan it. But she talked about, you remember what she talked about? About grace. We love the grace of salvation and the day we got saved, and then we think that, she didn't say it this way, but kind of we, we think we're now, now we're going to stay saved by our works. No, it's still grace. It's just as much a, a relationship of grace today as the day you got saved. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
We should be farther on down the line in the, the process of sanctification, and we're going to get there in a minute. But it, it's still grace. It's still grace. It's not what you did. It's not what you said. It's not what you didn't do. It's not what you didn't say. Any of that. It's grace. It's grace. Forgiven of all trespasses. It says he wiped out the written charges against us, was taken away and nailed to the cross. And when it says the cross, it means the cross of Jesus Christ. In the same way that they took that stuff and nailed it, here's the condemnation of this guy. Every one of your trespasses was written on that thing that said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Every one of your trespasses, past, present, future, were put on that writ of condemnation and nailed to the cross of Jesus because at that point, He took on your sins. He took on the condemnation, the execution, the penalty for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the whole world so that they were done deal, done with. That's it. And it says he disarmed the principalities and powers. All right, that's that voice in your head that says, oh man, what kind of Christian are you? You just flipped off the guy that cut in front of you. What, what kind of person are you? Well, yeah, don't do that. We're not supposed to do that as Christians and get in line. But you're not going to hell because of that. And the mud slinging that the enemy tries to do with us is disarmed. And here's how it's disarmed in the best way. It's not the way we would do Oh, I didn't do it. Well, I didn't mean that. Well, he deserved that. Uh, that's all the stuff that we have. Here's how the principalities are disarmed. You're right. But Jesus died for that sin, so I am not guilty. And I am not facing the penalty of that sin. Thanks be unto God. Man, he's got no comeback to that. There's no comeback to that. Last one. Ephesians 4, 17. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard of him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt, i.e., rots, according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now catch this, Christian, because I read this passage for years and thought, oh, okay, here's the fine print for saved by grace. Now I gotta do all this stuff. I gotta put some, I gotta put take something off. I gotta put something on. Okay, it's grace, but then there's all this work that I gotta do. Right? Catch what he is saying here. First of all, he's saying, don't walk like the rest of the world. Don't, don't live your life like the rest of the world. The rest of the world says, be perfect, have a list of rules and regulations of what's right, and follow it, and if you do it, you might make it. How's the rest of the world walking? What's his description of the way that they walk? The futility of the mind. Come up with some great ideas, but it's futile. It's vain. It ain't going to work. Give it up. Darkened understanding, not understanding what God has done in Christ. Alienated from God due to ignorance and blindness. Ignorance. Well, I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know that. I'm blind to that. Past feeling and greedily sinning. Ah, oh, no, we, we don't want to just sin a little bit. We want to sin a lot. That's really what that is saying. And now... Put off, be, put on. Put off, be renewed, put on. Now, let's think about grammar. Put off. That's a command. That's telling you to do something. 
right? Put off. Put off the old man. Put off the old ways. Remember that word repent? That's changing your mind and saying, I'm going to go this way. I'm not going to go this way anymore. I'm going to go this way. I thought this was a good way to go. Well, now I'm going to go this way. It's a change of mind that now we initiate activity to do that. I'm taking off that coat. It's heavy. It's, man, that's it. I'm taking it off. I've changed my mind. I don't like this coat anymore. It's my old way. It's walking like the rest of the world, right? And not only that, it keeps rotting according to lying desires. That's what's saying there. Corrupted means rotting, decomposition of flesh. It's rotting according to lying desires. But I really want this. I really want to not have to work. And man, I could just kick back just all day long. And then you try that and you go, man, I'm really bored. I wish I had something to do. Man, maybe I'll go out and find a job. You know, we have this concept of what our desires are. They lie to us. Our desires lie to us. Man, if I just have sex with as many women as possible, then I'll be happy and good. No, you won't. You will become incapable of having a genuine, intimate, godly relationship with one of the other sex. And oh, by the way, the chances of getting unhealthy due to disease are really great. And, and all these kinds of things that happen. But man, our desires go, but, but that'd be good. But that'd be good. No, it's lying to you. It's lying to you. I'm going to start playing Powerball. If only I had a couple million dollars, I'd do good things with it. I could handle money. No, you can't. No, you can't. I don't care who you are. No, you can't. Christ in you can. But no, you can't. Put off. You're being lied to. Put off the old man. Okay, that's a command. That's something that we're commanded to do. But check the grammar in the next one. Be renewed. That's passive voice. That's not saying, and go out and get yourself renewed. No. It's saying, be renewed. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Not just changing your mind like, okay, I know that's not the way I want to go. I want to go this way. No, it's being renewed because the whole spirit, attitude, power, spiritual end of your mind is being renewed into an entirely different way of thinking. You're being renewed. In another place, Paul talks about being renewed by the washing of the water of the word. I'm being changed. I am being changed. I'm not changing myself. I'm being changed. I made a decision to take off this heavy coat, and I said, renew me, Lord. And he does. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now you are capable of putting on a new coat and put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So yeah, there's some stuff to do. There's some stuff that's our responsibility. Put it off, put it on. Put it off, put it on. But the key part is being renewed. Being renewed by the Lord. And that's possible because of the cross and the resurrection. Because all of your transgressions and trespasses have been forgiven, nailed to the cross. The enemy is disarmed no matter what he says. Whatever he says is a lie. You are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you don't have to live in the guilt and condemnation of that. Don't take that on. Put that off. That's part of the putting off. It's not just putting off deeds of the flesh. It's putting off an attitude that says, oh, well, oh, but God hates me because I did this, I did that. No, he doesn't. He loves you just as much today as the day you were born. Not even just as the day that you got saved, as the day you were born. Because he loved you that much then. 
You see, the problem is there are too many like the Roman soldiers just going about day-to-day -day activity. I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. And Jesus forgave them, but they didn't receive that forgiveness. So they were just too busy doing their own thing and didn't care and didn't believe it, didn't whatever. No, I'm not going to, yeah, there's a gift there. Pfft, I don't want it. It's not that big a deal. That's what happens. That's the deal. God has made this way. And he's given it to us. And as I look into your faces, most of you have received that and walk in that. So truly walk in that today. Keep taking off that big, heavy coat and put on that nice, comfy one after having been renewed. That's what the cross does. The cross has changed your life, and it is the reason that your life can change in a permanent way, not just in an old fixer-upper, put-a-new-paint-job-on, but in a genuine way. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for what you have done at the cross. And how you have made the way for us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk fully and completely in the power and the grace and the mercy and the blessedness of what you have done at the cross. Lord, don't let us fall back into old ways, not just of acting, but of thinking and of attitude and understanding. We don't want to walk in ignorance or in blindness, or in darkened understanding. We want the full light of your Spirit to carry us each and every day by the power of your Spirit, through the wonder of your grace and love, into being new people created in you for righteousness and holiness. Help us, Lord. You know how much we need it. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace every day of your life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and our King arriving very soon. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless you all.